Welcome to London Business School again. We're looking forward to hear what you've got to say. Thank Toby you. Rowan. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Toby, and um, I guess I'm what you might call a, a serial internet entrepreneur. Probably a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about this evening are, are maybe relevant only to those who are interested in, in internet startups, um, but I know that a lot of people at, at LBS uh, are. So um, I'm going to talk about, uh, Aditya said you've got to keep it personal. So um, I've got some, uh, some personal stories, some family stuff, um, you know, all together for a type of talk I've not actually given before, so um, just, just bear with me. Um, I started on this journey about 12 years ago, uh, 1999. Every single person of that age you know, had to kind of do an internet startup. Then I, I was 30 years old. Um, since then, I've been, um, I've been part of four internet ventures. Uh, I co-founded or founded three of them. Um, we, I've been part of a small part, generally, of about $270 million of exit. Um, I've raised personally 40 million pounds of, of capital. Um, on both this side of the Atlantic and, and in the United States. Uh, that was over five different rounds. Um, so I had a kind of good experience of lots of different situations in uh, online, online sort of venture companies, from, from starting them from the early days, uh, and um, uh, nothing, I think nothing really prepares you for the experience of, of you know, sitting down in an office by yourself um, with a, a kind of a, you know, a laptop and starting to, you know, starting to kind of push that ball and see if you can make it roll. Um, from, so that very dreamy experience, which I don't recommend you, know, you sort of do throughout your life, through to the sort of more exciting, can't sleep at night kind of experiences of you know, selling companies uh, and, um, uh, and everything in between. Uh, and, and lastly, also, also closing them down. You know, I, I, um, I probably, um, well known in the LBS uh, MBA world for being one of the, the case studies where uh, our first business, clickmango.com, um, was a, a study in failure. Um, and um, uh, and, and you, you, know, you can learn a tremendous amount from, from that. Um, Rupert was just, uh, was just talking to me about the, uh, the situation of, of talking, about, you know, talking about failure in a, in a, public, uh, in a public place. Um, and we were sort of debating it and, and saying, well, you know, there's, there's a negative side to those things because you know, failure is discouraging. And I said, I think the only time that you can actually, you, you have to be able to um, talk about failure having then succeeded, otherwise the story doesn't have a happy ending. You know, so. Um, so now, now I like to talk about failure sometimes. Um, so I, I think the story I'm going to tell is, is, is interesting, or the back, my background is interesting. Um, uh, because I think I, I, I come from three generations of entrepreneurs. So uh, my my grandfather was an was an Anglo German. Uh, he was uh, he died a long time ago, a long time before I was born, and uh, he was a, a very successful entrepreneur. And um, he had the, the distinction of having his his fortune um, confiscated twice. So once once by the British in India for being German, uh, and once by the Germans in Germany for being British. Um, so, so um, anyway, but he passed on something to my to my father, who was also an entrepreneur, um, who was called Tiny Roland, uh, who was a businessman who was very active in the uh, in the 60s, 70s, uh, and 80s in London, and, and, and built up a what became a very large business, a multi-billion-pound business called, called Lunro, uh, and Lunro is, is then well known as the or is is the parent of something called Lunmin. Uh, which is on the on the, um, the still on the stock market today. Um, so uh, so my father left left Germany, fled Germany with uh, my grandfather immediately before the Second World War. And, uh, although he was actually interrogated by the Gestapo before uh, before leaving, um, and then did his military service here in the UK. Um, <clears throat> his brother served, in fact, in the German army. Uh, so uh, we were completely divided between the two. Uh, and then when my father arrived here, uh, here in Britain, he, um, after the war, he very quickly was very naturally entrepreneurial in, in a way, that, uh, in a way that, that much more than I ever could be, and was someone who was immediately buying and selling businesses and, uh, and uh, making money on them and uh, you know, manufacturing nail files and fridges, uh, 
uh, after the war um, and made a tremendous amount of money and uh, and, and then started building up this, this Lunro business. And Lunro was a, it became a huge business. So Lunro was uh, a business that owned hotels, it owned the London Metropole, which I think is still the biggest hotel in London. Uh, he owned uh, the Observer newspaper when it was a, a kind of very famous, uh, I think one of the oldest newspapers in the UK, uh, and very influential. He owned um, all sorts of other things. He owned something called Western, he built up something called Western Platinum, which is one of the largest uh, platinum mines in the world. And, um, but he was also sort of dogged by controversy. Um, and, uh, you know, he was kind of a, a very much a sort of larger than life character. Uh, my father, who just, um, you know, was constantly kind of touring, uh, touring Africa, these sort of quite, you know, like uh, deep down, interesting places in, in Africa, uh, and made all sorts of unsuitable friends. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you, know, he, uh, you know, he was well known for, as having his, uh, um, Muammar Gaddafi as his business partner, as I'm strange, <laughs> uh, on, on the, the Metropole Hotels, and so was not popular with the um, British establishment. You know, he, again, he was um, someone who, you know, who was very experienced uh, in boardroom battles uh, and who consistently had, um, had sort of uh, run-ins with, uh, with people. I'll talk, about, I'll talk about some of those things um, in a moment. Um, anyway, so that was kind of the, um, uh, the, the, the back, my kind of uh, childhood background that uh, I'm sure like a lot of people in this room, that if you grow up with, uh, you know, like a, an entrepreneur or a, a, sort of a business person, a committed business person as your parent, then you naturally, you know, that is your, your hero, isn't it? I mean, it's, you, you aspire to that. And people who aren't that are, are um, just, uh, well, you're just, you're just not interested. You don't want to be a violinist. Um, you want to be, um, you want to be that, uh, that businessman. So, so that was the, the background. So, I, I, you know, I personally have always, always aspired to being, uh, to being a, a, a businessman, a, an entrepreneur, and, um, and always had kind of crazy business ideas as a kid, uh, and, and sometimes followed through on them. Probably one of the, my best first businesses was um, uh, in, at the age of sort of 22 or something, I, I started collecting um, pickup lines off the internet. <laughs> and I, and I, I made this giant collection of them, and then I sort of put, I created a sort of book out of these things, uh, which is very unprofessional, but then I, and I started advertising that book in the back of men's magazines, and I, and I found an insatiable demand. <laughs> um, and, um, and it was one of those things where, you know, I was sort of, um, I think I was, I was doing, I was doing, just after university, and I started selling it. Uh, I was working at KPMG Management Consulting, and and then I'd sort of come back from KPMG, and I, and I, like these endless checks would be coming through the letterbox from men who wanted this that, the thousand and one pickup lines that I was, and I would be manufacturing the books myself and stuffing the envelopes, <laughs> and I was very embarrassed about the whole thing because I, the whole th you know, it was obviously a bit, you know, it is, it was an embarrassing product. But, um, and so I didn't dare talk to anyone about it, so I couldn't bring any labor. And I was just going home and stuffing these envelopes. So finally, there was too much demand, I just stopped. So, <laughs> um, but I also, I always had, you know, I always aspired to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to starting a business. Um, now, um, so my dad, uh, I would say, was, was someone who, you know, again, con controversial, yeah, incredibly successful, um, incredibly mesmerizing, mesmerizingly charismatic, who was just um, uh, someone who, who was full of charm uh, and um, was always going to build huge businesses. But along the way, that, that, that didn't necessarily endear him to a lot of people who were around him. Um, and, you know, my father was... Uh, you know, would have a lot of board members who perhaps would, who would go along in the good times, you know, everyone keeps quiet because, you know, in the good times you're, you're, uh, you're always safe on you. Um, but in the bad times, the seeds that you sow uh, when you're, if you're perhaps arrogant with people or if you're, you know, if you just sort of brush over people, um, those seeds can, 
then grow and, and they can come out to haunt you. Um, and my father, you know, like over time, uh, found that those that he did this have those problems. Um, and uh, you know, he became involved in a lot of uh, a lot of legal legal battles um, with people who who he came across. Muhammad fired. Uh, he spent a lot of money on those, and he had um, you know a lot of difficulties. And I would say, finally, to you know, at the age of uh, he started to think maybe about retiring. Uh, in his late 70s, and he, he uh, brought in someone um, who I think at the time I remember him telling us, yes, he's like a, a, another son to me. Um, this character, Dieter Bock, who recently choked to death on a piece of steak in his hotel room. Um, and um, anyway, but this, this character, you know, initially was uh, very, very friendly to my dad, um, but, <laughs> but then he turned, um, and I think. It was it was a very like an interesting experience for me to see a lot of people who, once upon a time, had um, been great supporters of my father, people who had uh, whose careers had been made by him. He might have made them rich, um, but they turned they turned because uh, the feeling feelings of jealousy and feelings of um, uh, you know where people's egos might have been bruised. Those people then, then, then turned on my father and and uh, you know. Threw him out of Lunro years before he should have gone at the age of 79. You know, I think he had a good, a good 10 years left. Um, anyway, so, but I thought that was interesting, and it made me sort of think about about. Um, uh, it, it, it made me think throughout my life about uh, you know boards and, um, and business partners. You know, so um, I think I, I've been relatively lucky with people that I've I've been in business with. Um, I've been, I've started a business with one of my oldest friends and, and we actually stay oldest and best friends today. And I think that, you know, that's um, quite lucky actually in, <laughs> in a way. Um, I would say, I've had, I have one business I started with people who I actually ultimately thought probably weren't, weren't very good business partners. Um, and I, that can be for a lot of different reasons. You know, you, the, the thing about business partners is very often people jump into them as if it was, you know, like a sort of one night stand. Uh, but it is very much a marriage. Um, and you're with the people for, for a, very, a terribly long time. Um, so I, I, I've, um, I think from, from my dad's uh, perspective, he, uh, he started in, in 1973, I think he had the majority of his board attempted to, to throw him out of his company. Uh, and, uh, and and that that marked him, and, and later on it was uh, it, it kind of happened again. Um, and I, you probably can't you can't avoid it. You know, ultimately relationships you know can go sour over time. Even even the very best relationships. Um, I think that if you if you get into a, a business relationship, um, or if you have business partners, um, I think that. Um, you're going to know very. People know that very quickly. I've always, when I've had bad business partners, I've always known known it almost uh, instantly. Like from you, know, you, you start, you get into it a week later. You're thinking, actually, you know, these people aren't very collaborative, or these people are you know not very smart, uh, or these people actually don't like to make outbound calls uh, and get people to do things. You know, these people just want to get paid, um, and you know, and I could be paying them and getting the same service, but in fact, I'm sharing equity with these people. And I think now, what I've learned about, about business partners is, um, is that you're much better off, uh, if, if you have that feeling, it's only going to get worse over time. You know, they, they say about marriage, that if you, if, or they say about divorce, that if, you know, if you're going to get divorced from somebody, um, you know the reason why you'll divorce them as you're walking up the aisle. Um, and, uh, and I think it's very much the same with business partners, you know, that you, you kind of raise money and, and you suddenly things go wrong. Uh, a good example is, uh, was a friend of mine, a friend of mine recently, uh, he raised $5 million from, from, um, from a, uh, a big London venture capital house. I won't say which one, but it begins with B and it ends with an N. Um, so, um, he, uh, so, so, so he had this, he put this whole thing together. Uh, he brought in a business partner, um, and, uh, and he'd known the business partner, I think, for seven days by the time that uh, they actually kind of went into the first meeting. 
And lo and behold, um, say, I think it was six months later, you know, he was calling me up and it, it, the whole thing went wrong and the, the venture capitalist actually threw him out uh, and, um, uh, you know, and, and he was gone, you know, and, and it was, the venture capitalist threw, along with the partner, threw him out because the, the, the investor liked the partner more and the partner was, was not a collaborator uh, with someone who, who he didn't know. Um, and, um, you know, that, that's, it, it was a terrible shame. It's the kind of experience that, um, that again, marked him very badly. So I've been, I've, I've been thinking about this and, I, and I've evolved some rules for, for choosing business partners as a result because they're, they're, they're kind of critical to, to success. And the rules that I've, that I've um, thought of are that when I, I only start a business with, some, with someone that I actually know quite well in, in a work context, um, so with, with a friend, I think it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a dice game. I mean, they, they might be great at work, um, they, they might actually be, able to be a bit of a pain um, because people have very different work personalities. So I, I always want to know what someone's really like um, in, in work um, because I want to know that you know, I, can, I can collaborate with them. And secondly, I, I want to find people who are good at pressure, uh, are good under pressure. And most businesses will have a point when they, they kind of nearly go under um, or where it's very, much, it's very much on the edge and it looks like there's really nothing to save. Uh, and you might just be doing something else. And I, I find that there's, there's some people who just completely lose the will to live at that point and just kind of want to sit down and hug themselves uh, in a corner. Um, and they feel a sense of shame and the, the sense of, uh, you know, the, the, the sense of embarrassment that sort of is very constraining on them. So I, I try and avoid those people. Go with people who just really thrive when things are, uh, when things are bad. People who are really great when things are, when, they're on top, but just not, not ideal. Lastly, I like to find people who've got very different skills to me. And I think, you know, here in, like, uh, in the business school, a lot of MBAs I meet, um, and they, they kind of band together with other MBAs um, in order to do things. And then suddenly you find you've got a company with, which is in a long development cycle where you're building a product, and you've got two or three people who all want to make PowerPoint slides and, you know, organizational <laughs> structures. And there's and there's very little to you know this it's just it's just a clash you know um, and lastly I think that you know talking about numbers I, I try and um, at a certain point you realise that four people is, is too many you know that you, that um, people go for safety in numbers and like in terms of co-founders and stuff I like to have uh, you know three two or right now I have you know just myself uh, I so I've, I'm trying a new business as, as a founder. Uh, and um, you know that's a very different experience. Um, now, talking about time, you know, I, I said how this thing is a is a marriage. Um, I'm going to talk about talk about time. Some some things can go very quickly. So, like I said, in, in 1999, uh, you know, I, I I quit my job. I worked. I used to work at Walt Disney, um, and I quit my job. Um, and, and a friend quit on the same day, and, and uh, we then wrote a business plan in a month, and we then pitched. And I think we, we resigned in July and June. Uh, we did our first pitch on the sort of seventh of August or something like that. And um, by this, the uh, seven days later or whatever, we we um, we got an agreement. We had a term sheet for three million pounds of funding. And, um, and this was a you know this was obviously a, a time. It's very hard to imagine how how things were at that time. Um, but we were, you know, we were a couple of young guys. Uh, we were on page page uh, three of the FT with a big article. This is from the Evening Standard, I think. Um, we were on, um, uh, you know, we were everywhere, uh, and uh, we were on the Money Program. I mean, it was crazy times, um, and um, uh, it's, everything went very quickly. You know, this this business was um, it was super nuts in fourteen months. So we so we raised money in in whatever seven days. Um, we uh, we took six months to build a product. We launched a product, uh, and uh, three months later uh, we had to close it down <laughs> because we'd blown all of the three million pounds in that time, including like spending, uh, well, building this beautiful website. You can see that that took at least a million. Um, <laughs> 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 
Um, and then um, spending £200,000 to hire Joanna Lumley to promote <laughs> it. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you know, like, I mean, so lots of crazy things. Yeah? So, so you can see that somehow three million, you know, wasn't really keeping us going. Uh, you know, we needed more money, and um, anyway, we didn't didn't get any more money. <laughs> so, so uh, unfortunately, um, so Click Mango died. But I think that the the great thing about that was that that was it was so quick, um, it was so fast, um, and so the learning, you know, it was like an INSEAD course. Um, <laughs> Not as not as good as a, as an LBS course, but you know, like can you kind of get the basics? Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So, so the whole thing was finished. Now that was beautiful, but if only all businesses could be like that. But they're not. You know that that you can have a bad business that hangs around like a bad smell. Uh, you know, you're in it for three years or something. And then you, at the end of it, you've got nothing out of it, not even any good CV points. In fact, people then come out, you know, then ask you why you're such a sort of albatross, destroying, you know, losing investor money and whatever. Uh, on top of the fact that you just wasted three years of your life. So, so yeah, so this time thing is, is it's been really important. I've really noticed it, you know, that that um, like the sort of fresh faced, you know, how fresh faced we were, and uh, uh, and then you know, time time goes by, and um, and it, the same thing applied with, with it was different with King because King was a very big success. So I started King, uh, we, we had a business called Udate, um, which um, I was VP marketing. We sold that for, um, for 100, 100, well, depending on how you calculate it, 150 or 200 million dollars to uh, a guy called Barry Diller. Um, and that was the world's second biggest uh, dating service. And we, uh, that was in Derby. <laughs> And uh, I had to I had to drop out of my London Business School Masters in Finance course in order to go to Derby and and be part of this thing. Um, and uh, people always ask me if I jumped or was I pushed uh, out of LBS, but um, no, I did I did quit. Uh, so <laughs> and um, this but this thing you know then continues to so 2004 and it's a it's a long time now. Now King is more about Facebook games. It's more of a social game site. Uh, King, had, when, I, when I resigned as co-CEO in, in 2008, uh, we had about um, 300 million games played every month. Um, we had about 30 million visitors. And the company is very, very big and very, you know, very profitable. Uh, and see about 100 people. So a nice kind of, a nice change from, from closing businesses down is making them very big. Uh, and uh, you know, all the lessons that come alongside that of, uh, of exit. But, so I, I uh, had five years in there. But my partners are still in that. Uh, and so they've been doing that for eight years. Now, uh, that's, you know, that's, it's quite a long time. And if you think about any jobs that you might have been in for eight years, it's, it's such a long time. At least you have the option to get out. When you're, when you're doing a startup, you're, you're in it for, un, until it's acquired, really, until it's, uh, until it's over. So that was a, you know, that, that's something. And, and I know friends of mine, I mean, uh, I, I was um, this guy called Jason Gissing and the guy called T um, a, a bunch of guys who who in 1999 were bond traders. And I remember Jason Gissing coming over to our um, our Click Mango office in Brick Lane, and and Jason was a bond trader at Goldman Sachs, uh, and, but he had this completely rational desire to do a startup, uh, and he had they had lots of ideas, and I, mean, I can't for the life of me think why he did this. But he then said, no, I'm, we're going to start an online supermarket. And they started this thing in 2001, just when everything was blowing up. Uh, and uh, the three of these guys did it. And, but the interesting thing to me was that they didn't, they didn't really think it, or if they thought it through, they would have realized that actually, you're in it forever. You know? <laughs> and these guys have been, they commute up to Hertfordshire to this bloody great big warehouse, you know, where the where the office of Ocado is, and they've been do they could have been just getting a Goldman Sachs and becoming incredibly wealthy. They'd probably all be retired by now. Um, so anyway, it's, it's something people don't really think about before uh, before getting into it. Um, so. The next thing I want to talk about is um, it, again. This is this. I'm talking about stuff that's 
really relevant here to technology startups. I, I know people from LBS go and do all kinds of things, um, and I've sat on panels here with you know, people who started restaurants and all, all sorts of exciting businesses. But, um, but I, I'm going to talk about something which is really kind of particular to technology startups, um, which is the, uh, this, uh, this question of technology co-founders. Now, um, in Silicon Valley, it's, it's, it's axiomatic that you have uh, an engineer on the team. You have a very, very good engineer who is part of a, of a founding team, and, and that is from day one. And here it's less important. You know, people aren't, people just aren't so focused on that. Uh, they think it's, they think it's, they think it's would be nice, but they'll also just go with people who've got you know good sort of business making experience. So, um, so I, I've seen, I've seen it both ways. I, I started with, uh, I, I started with um, King.com with uh, with technology co-founders with engineers on board. Uh, and we all shared the uh, we, we all shared the equity, and that cut the equity quite down quite fine. Uh, and so my 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 new company, which is called MangaHigh.com, which is a mathematics company uh, teaching mathematics through games, I thought, well, do you know what? I'm gonna those people think a different way to me. You know, those engineers want to be paid, and I'm in a lucky position of having sold a lot of shares in King.com to private equity funds and whatever. So I'm just gonna employ. Engineers who I might otherwise have been showing up upside with, and and I think that's also something different to the valley. You know, in, in America, engineers are much more focused on options and being part of the action. Here, you can get people to who um, you know, it's, it's much easier to get people just just to come work. Uh, and and I, I think uh, yeah, and I learned I learned a lesson about this actually, um, which yeah, I learned a tough lesson um, because. The, the truth is that you make a lot of decisions in the early days of a startup, which you then, again, live with for many, many years. You, know, you make decisions on technology platforms, you make decisions on architecture, uh, you make all, all kinds of decisions that you then, that then may really hurt you later on. And I made a decision, like, because I didn't have the help of, of a really good engineer on my side or a really good project manager, uh, I made a decision which, is, which absolutely was terrible. Uh, and uh, in this math site, um, we have a um, uh, we had uh, we've got to have a lot of math questions. Here. We have a lot of maths quizzes, and I and I sort of went into this thinking, do you know what? The quizzes are going to be great. They're going to be so much fun. The kids are going to love doing them, uh, and I want them to be to have sound and animation and lots of groovy things. And there's this wonderful platform called Flex from Adobe. That is really easy to make things on, and we can just uh, we can do it in there. So we we chose this uh, we chose this platform, and we chose a developer, and uh, the, the project was poorly specified and um, and poorly chosen, uh, and um, and so um, but but I didn't realize you know I did, it took me a long time to know that, and uh, so we built a platform that could generate questions and could display quizzes and could engage kids and could and could do all sorts of things. And we built on that 55,000 math questions, each with its own hint and solution. And then we built 2,000 learning pages on top of that as well. And they were all authored in this great flex environment. And, uh, and, it, was, and it was terrible. And at a certain point, we realized that the architecture of the original platform was so bad that nothing less than a complete recode of this thing that had taken eight months to build um, was, gonna, was gonna work. And not only that, we then realized that, you know, that basically the Flex platform, the Flash platform, are under terrible uh, attack from, uh, from uh, Apple. And um, that Adobe is kind of, uh, is sort of fighting for, fighting for life. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, um, and so we had this, and so we had this thing, and the, the platform became impossible to, to develop with because the, the coding was so low quality, all down to my early kind of penny-pinching uh, errors in terms of uh, in terms of how I brought in the development team and the fact that I'd slightly scrimped and saved on on um, high level engineering talent at the beginning and uh, uh, and it was terrible and the, the mistake uh, cost me uh, it cost the business something like um, uh, like probably in terms of maybe more than a hundred thousand pounds in just in, in terms of contractor costs but then in terms of internal development time. Uh, cost about one and a half million. No, sorry, not one and a half million. 
one, one and a half uh, years of, uh, of developer man time, of, of our best developers. So, um, no, more like two years of, uh, of, of, of man time. Um, and that was in order to, um, to develop this wonderful new product, uh, <laughs> which uh, the only difference was it's HTML. So um, anyway, so I learned, uh, I learned a tough lesson uh, on that one. I, I don't think I'd do that again. Um, boards, boards again, boards are interesting. Um, because of, of my, my father's experience of, um, of boards, you know, I, I think I probably was quite sus suspicious of uh, what, um, what board directors, external board directors, what, you know, what are they thinking? Who are they? What are they, what are they, uh, what are they gonna do to me? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but um, that is, uh, I think that when, when people come in, that is, uh, is, is a feeling, because they're outsiders. And I think there's, an, there's a natural thing, a feeling among, when you're the, an operating person, um, that people, the board directors, uh, come from the outside, and they don't know anything about your business. So how can so it's more a matter of explaining to them, you know, what you're doing and why it's a good thing, rather than engaging them. And, and I think that's been sort of a like a, a tendency that I that I had um, uh, in the early days of boards. You know, that like I think probably when I would, would they teach something like would they teach boards here at LBS? Is, are there any courses about how to be on a board? Anyone? No? No one's aware of it? Well, I think they should. Uh, <laughs> but I definitely wouldn't be able to teach it. Um, they, uh, so, so I think it's, it's something that people can't prepare you for. And recently I, I've had a, a, an interesting experience of being non-exec on a company called, um, it's a company called eRepublic.com, which is a very big MMO. And um, people from Macedonia fight for their independence from Greece, and people from Greece fight with Turkey and it's all, it's e-Turkey and e-Greece and, you know, e-everywhere. And, uh, and it, it's, anyway, so anyway, it's a wonderful business. And um, what I found, in, what I found interesting about it was that I, I kind of feel like, I wish I'd done that non-exec directorship before any of my other exec directorships, because then I would have seen how these, how boards work and what the dynamic is between non-execs and execs. Uh, and I think that would have been tremendously valuable. So I, I think it would be a great kind of internship, would be just as, you know, not do photocopying, but just go and be a board director somewhere uh, <laughs> so, um, as a non-exec. And, and wonderful practice for actually having your own board. And it helps you to come back and, and sit on the fence and say, okay, what are the, the, you know, these, what are these people thinking? What are these people thinking? And as an exec, the companies, I've always had the feeling like, um, you know, the board are interfering, uh, you know, and the board want to do things. And then as a non-exec, you have a, this kind of corresponding feeling of powerlessness. And uh, because you, you know that in fact, as a non-exec, all of the, the um, decisions are actually getting made by the, you know, by the uh, execs. And that's, everything that's happening, you know, you're meeting once every couple of months. In the meantime, a million decisions have been made and a lot of, and the company's completely changed direction. And you've probably been notified over the phone or something like that. but. So there's very few situations where you, where I, I found that that uh, you know, action of the board has then ended up really governing you know the the operating activity of the company, and and, and yet what the board wants is um, is is to sort of see the company through the through the exec's eyes and to to engage. You know, I, I think I think the worst board meetings I've ever had are the ones where we've prepared too much. And there's been a million amazing slides about things we're going to do, and you know, to, to show the board members what a great company that they're uh, being non-execs of, and they actually hate it. You know, they because they, they, they what they want to do is come along and, and talk. You know, they want to really talk about stuff and and just get, maybe not know very much, maybe just go with what the kind of instinctive feelings they have, uh, and engage with people below, below the sea level. Uh, have fun with people in the company. Look at the things that the operating things that the people in the company are seeing, and um, and I think you know my my dad once described um, once described uh, non-execs as uh, as uh, ornaments on a Christmas tree, um, which was then unfortunately sort of publicised, and uh, and I, I wonder very very much what those non-execs then thought, 
uh, how you know how happy they were about about being described in that way. Whether they wanted to, and, and whether they then had a lasting resentment towards him. Uh, I, I think they probably did. You know? So, um, so it's yeah. So boards, I think, are, you know, a, a very the, it's a it's a fascinating skill of, of running boards uh, and of engaging people and, and, and drawing them in. And I think it's. The, the, the great thing about boards is that they can't is that they tend not to do a lot um, and then and the other great thing is that is that uh, yeah personnel when it comes down to personnel boards are you know fire you uh, and uh, you know I, I've had uh, I've had hostile boards before and um, you know you get uh, it's it can be very bad big boards can be very hostile because if you have a lot of people there um, you have inevitably you have factions forming so if you, once you've got more than sort of six, eight, you know, once you start to have sort of double figures of people, you know, you have people getting together offline and, and talking, you know, what, were you happy with that? Were you happy with that? Uh, should we, uh, you know, like they, you, you naturally, as that group, you naturally have counter, counter groups forming within it. So it, it's, um, you know, you, it, it takes a lot of doing. And, I, and I, again, I think that it's, uh, it's worth doing almost anything to avoid uh, to avoid those bigger fractioned um, fractioned uh, board meetings, um, th th I've been in a situation before, of, you know, you, where you end up uh, in a very in a very kind of clumsy way. You know, you have board selections, and you have uh, you know execs will have to sort of to argue against each other and argue why they should why they should remain. Uh, and those the the very difficult very difficult situations. No one can make them good at, and it's worth very much avoiding them. And lastly, talking talking about um, talking about exits, uh, I, I've learned some lessons there. Um, you know, my my father was fortunate in ne you know, never selling his company. He kept his company for for um, thirty years. Uh, but here here in kind of modern dot com dot com internet land. You know, exits are a natural part of life. Uh, you know, they come late, like we've talked about. You know, they come if they're good. They come after six or seven years. That's, that takes. That's how long it takes to make an interesting company. But um, I learned a lot from uh, a guy called Mel Morris, who's the um, he was the CEO of Udate.com. Udate was the biggest exit of 2002, like I said, um, globally, uh, and um, a, a wonderful business. And um, and Mel was the, the, the uh, CEO of Udate, and he became the chairman of, of King.com. So a very talented man, uh, you know, a DBA, a technical person, but also a, a brilliant salesman. Um, and, and he really taught me something interesting about exits. And he taught me uh, that when it comes to exits, you, know, you, you want to be friends with everybody. Um, something that you know, I see a lot is, is people, uh, people you kind of mentally demonize your competition and, and I've been in lots of very competitive situations where there's a company just like you uh, that is you know, competing with you for investor funds, for, for uh, deals, distribution deals. Uh, and what I've seen is that you, you, know, you start to mentally dislike those people. And what Mel told me was that, that instead you should, you should love them uh, and you should go to them and, and take them out because ultimately those people are the most likely to, to buy you. Uh, you know, some, someone who's competitive to you or who's going in the same direction as you wants your position uh, and um, yeah so I, I, I found uh, I, I, that's, it's a counterintuitive thing you sort of want to kick against something it gives you gives you reason to get up in the morning and to try that bit harder but actually uh, I, I've learned about exits is that you know, the more kind of love you give out uh, the more the more love you uh, will return will, uh, will receive in return from those, those kind of partners um, yeah, so I, I, I think that's it actually. I've probably overrun slightly. Um, so, uh, anyway, thank you. Well, there's lots of insight in there. I'm sure there's some questions around the floor that uh, we. Please. What prompted you to leave King.com given that you co founded it? I, I had a, a, an idea for, for something new, um, and King King.com was very stable. You know, you, King.com was um, uh, was a company that 
didn't need a massive amount of, of management from, from London. It was the main development centre was in Sweden. Um, so uh, our role was, uh, you know, ha having got there, having done all the deals and everything that made it really big, um, it, it, it took, didn't need a huge amount of management from London after a certain point. It was just kind of going on its track. And, and I had an idea for something something new, you know, so, which is this, this manga hyphen. Uh, and I, I kind of had a feeling like the longer I waited, um, someone else was going to do it. Um, because it seemed to me like just a, a sort of obvious, an obvious kind of next step. And I think with, with King, it was this, there was a fragmentation of equity, which meant that I, I didn't want to be there for another 15 years because I was already too diluted down. You know, we sold a lot of shares to, to APAC partners. Um, we had taken on a couple of rounds at the beginning. There'd been a few co-founders. And so, you know, like my equity was, was quite diluted down. So the company was gonna have to be very, very big if I was to make, uh, if I was to, you know, have my boat or something. <laughs> um, and, and so, I, you know, I, I just wanted to, to get on and, and do the next thing. Fortunately, the company made a lot of profits, um, so the company was able to, to buy me out. Um, yeah, well, Man Manga High is still very much a work in progress. I mean, it's, it's growing very quickly in, in the United States and UK. Um, but uh, the, I, I learned something about education. You know, coming from, from the sort of wider dot-com or the internet world, you're always very focused on product. You know, like, make, let's make a wonderful product. People will, people will love that. People will pay for it. Education is all about business model. And people don't really, people don't really, the product can be terrible in education. That, that's why a lot of people are attracted to the industry. So, um, so, so that, that was really why, was, was that, um, you know, we, that getting the right business model is the key to making a good education startup. Uh, and so we're, yeah, we're still working on, on, uh, on Manga Highs. The, the business model in Australia has been, has been very good. I mean, just selling to schools there has been, has been really good. Hmm. Okay, well, please. More questions, please. What came first, the idea or the partner? Were you looking for a partner who had an idea or the idea just happened by going to some other partner? Typically, um, well, Click Mango, uh, my partner actually had the idea. Um, and um, King, we found, uh, what was it? it was, King was a knockoff, King was a clone of a US company. Uh, we all, a bunch of guys, we, we identified that as, as the best of a number of different things we do. Um, and then Manga High, no, no partners. U-Date was, was someone else's thing. Yeah, yeah like, like I said, you know, someone who's, um, someone who's good under pressure. Uh, in America, they'll tend to have like um, you'll have a, a, a kind of salesy guy or a salesy person, and and, uh, and then you'll have a, um, a kind of project manager slash uh, UX person, you know, someone who can who can draw a wireframe and then get that made with quality or make it themselves with quality. So uh, so you'll you'll bring those two. Well, or well, the other one they'll do is they'll have a graphic designer who also does uh, user experience. So I, I think you know, like a sales, a salesy guy, a salesy person, and uh, uh, an engineering person, I think is a good is a good kind of two man team. Right? Um, Toby, your father was um, a very impressive businessman, as I was a young businessman. He was one of the people I looked up to. Obviously, he got um, very sore and twisted with being thrown out of his own business. And I, I think part of your presentation is he. Sort of fear of non-exec is come through very strongly in your presentation. You use it in the middle at the end, but actually I wish I'd done the non-exec thing first, because you can actually see how you got your experience, actually how you can mentor and help 
No, not at all. I mean, I think um, I was trying to describe a journey and saying you know, that, um, that, uh, that I, it, it's, it's obviously non-execs bring a tremendous amount of value. I, I hope that I bring a tremendous amount of value to, uh, to the company where, to the single company where I am in non-exec. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't, I, I don't, if I've uh, given the impression that I don't believe that, then, then uh, you know, that's, that's the wrong impression. Um, I, I think, but I think it is interesting, you know, how people, uh, not just myself, um, you know, re react to them. Yeah. But fighting against those sort of instinctive reactions. Do you think that's more the sort of venture capital quote? Um, well, it, it depends what kind of situations you, you know you've been. In. Um, you know, I, I've known. You think about um, you think about online. Uh, you have it, it tends to move very fast on the, on the board level. I mean, say for instance, Sequoia Ventures yeah, in, in the United States. Sequoia Ventures will replace the majority of um, of uh, CEOs within the first two years so in the businesses that they invest in. So, uh, so I would say your experiences may have been you may have been very different, but for a majority of people uh, in in my world of the, of the internet, um, they're seeing that you know the, the, there's dragons there as well, uh, and um, and you know boards you, you've got to think about boards and be good at them. Um, yeah, it's it's um, it's not for everyone doing it alone. I would say um, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's much tougher because I think you know in, in any business um, there's uh, in any startup you've got someone who's there at the top you know who, who may do very well and has a lot of the fun of managing it, but also is someone who will develop an insomnia problem. Now um, that person that insomnia can be shared among a few different people, um, but when you're the founder, there's one person in the business who doesn't sleep, and that's you. And so, yeah, that, that's, um, that, that's what I think. I, I'd say with, um, with the founder thing, obviously there's a, there's a lot more value there. You know? So if things work out really well, it can, it's, um, it can be really great. If things, if things don't go well, uh, then um, it can be very painful. It can be much more painful. So could you uh, repeat the first part of the question? Really? If, you have, if you know that you have a good idea, what is the next steps? A few next steps that you make yes. sure. Um, I, think, I think there's a passage of time thing. Uh, so I, I always have, like, you know, have a lot of uh, business ideas. And then, and then the, the things that, I, that are good tend to sort of stick around. Uh, and then and they have a, nag, a sort of nagging presence. And you say, well, that, that is still good. You know, even a month later, that's still good. Three months later, yeah, I still think that's a good idea. Because normally, if something's bad, you come across the problems with it. You know, within a few weeks or, or, or a few hours of thinking of it. And, and so I think that just just letting things continue on um, for a little while is uh, is important. Uh, and then, um, yeah, to, I mean, talking to people, talking to a domain person. You know, it, it may be a very horizontal business, um, uh, but if it's like a you know a business in a vertical, then Speak, putting your idea out in front of people in that domain is really critical because uh, you'll get some really incisive criticism, uh, and um, you know they, people will do through it um, probably because it's not maybe not how the industry works or you know they can see they see the way they, they see the dynamics and the human aspects of that business better than you do. Saying that they have added value, do you concur? 
uh, I, I think you know, there's some fantastic investors out there, um, and I mean they're they like everything. Yeah, it's it's um, you, you get every type, uh, but uh, I've come across some some very professional people. I've come across some some um, uh, for instance at, at Click Mango. Yeah, so so Click Mango, uh, you had two very inexperienced young men. Um, spending a lot of money on something and, and kind of making everyone look a bit, you know, slightly ridiculous. Uh, and so, uh, and, and so the board there um, were actually uh, a very mature board, um, so, or uh, Atlas Venture was the, uh, was the venture capitalist. Now, you would have thought that they would be uh, terribly, very aggressive and, uh, and angry with us or, or um, and, and of course they weren't because everyone thought the way at that time. So, so they were carried along with the enthusiasm of everybody in the world doing, doing um, online ventures. But even when things had gone terribly wrong, um, the, for instance, there was a, a gentleman called Christopher Spray, um, and he was extremely mature. And you know, he was a classic kind of patrician venture capitalist. He said, this thing didn't work out. But you know, he made some very funny jokes in the kind of final um, in the final board meeting, and uh, you know, and, and we all laughed, and it was I was amazed, kind of how big spirited um, the people were. It's not his money. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, the, the thing is, those people can take a punch, you know, um, because they see a lot of things. They see a lot of things that sort of go up and down. Um, so there's some there's some wonderful investors out there. In terms of private uh, private investors. I think um, I've seen some, you know, I've seen, again, all, all different types. You get some wonderful people who do, very, some very smart people who do um, private investments. We had a guy called Klaus Hommels um, at, uh, at King.com who was very, very influential in the success uh, and who's, uh, you know, he's a sort of serial angel investor. Uh, he was very, very good. And um, not, not a kind of conventional, conventional person maybe, but um, you know, he, he brought so many good things to business. And in, not only uh, introductions, but also just kind of guidance and uh, and macro advice. So, last question. So, last question, please. Uh, there's a small pattern in your um, talking about your ventures. Your first venture, you said you quit your job at Disney in order to go and start doing the business plan for your venture. And then the second one, I think you said you quit your main course here at LBS to go and start the uh, startup. Um, serious question. Um, yeah, I never believe people who are like doing it on half time, and unless they're developers. Like developers, weirdly can can do stuff. You know, they'll, they'll sort of tend to be working at night on something interesting, and you know that could really that could really work out. But um, you know, I, I I've not I've not must say I haven't actually seen anyone sort of do it half time and 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 uh, do it well. Uh, I, I prepared to be proved wrong. I just uh, I haven't seen it. Thank you very much for coming along. It's interesting to hear you talk so much about people. I, I, I'm ashamed to say I did quote your father's line on Christmas trees in my book on non-executives. So I hope you'll forgive me. <laughs> we met. I also like your line about MBAs, going into business with MBAs. Mm. Somebody once observed to me, a friend of, a friend of ours we were talking about earlier, that um, the only reason why MBAs go into business with MBAs is that's the best chance you get somebody who's vaguely intelligent who's still looking for a job. No. <laughs> <laughs> the people you re an MBA really needs to go into business with is a used car salesman who's just been released from prison. That's a good balance of complementary skills that you've been talking about. Thank you very much for coming along and sharing your